As relics of victory, Ottoman flags have survived in different old collections in Europe. As part of a wider project on Ottoman flags, I have published uh, those of the Medici Church of Santo Stefano in Pisa. And uh, other publications on this flag, uh, they often um, feature in co uh, exhibition catalogs and single collections of those in Austria and Poland have been published as well. And then there is uh, Walt Walter Dennis' important article in the Journal of Textile History that he wrote in the 70s. Vienna's museum still own over 70 Ottoman booty flags. Most of them are of cotton. Only three silk flags survive, and these interest us today. Discussing, dis discussing Ottoman silk banners from the wider Viennese context, all booty pieces, I will illustrate how these powerful carriers of Ottoman military identity were used in papal and Habsburg imperial propaganda. In Vienna, the, uh, in Vienna in general, Ottoman plunder forms a significant group of objects in museum collections. So flags uh, were not the only trophies, but they were among the most significant. They served a European royal imperial and religious propaganda better than any other objects, except prints, and those sometimes featured flags. Already in 1594, Habsburg imperial troops entered Vienna in triumphal procession with captured Ottoman weapons, flags, and banners. Other such processions followed in 1595 and 1601. Ottoman trophies were presented in 1604 upon the visit of two Iranian envoys to Vienna. They arrived to sound out the possibility of an alliance between the emperor and the Safavid ruler against the Ottomans. The exhibited Ottoman trophies documented Habsburgian activities of this sort, at that time not very successful, um, to the Iranians and underlined the hope of a closer collaboration. No, none of these flags survive. From the 16th century, they are mainly weapons uh, in the imperial collections. During the 16th century, the Imperial Habsburg army hardly celebrated major successes against uh, the Ottomans. The military event uh, considered as the turning point was the second siege of Vienna as late as 1683. You see the first siege in the Ottoman miniature and the image of the second siege in the print. The relief of Vienna was hailed as one of the greatest successes of the allied Christian European armies against the Muslim Ottomans, and it was heavily exploited for propaganda pro purposes. However, only in 1718, with the tre Treaty of Pasarowitz, exact boundaries were established, which secured relative peace for some time. During the 200 years of conflict, uh, there existed extended peaceful periods. Border zones were porous and the empires were in constant con uh, contact and exchange. And it must be stressed here that the great majority of goods from the Ottoman Empire arrived in Vienna through internationally active tradesmen and envoys and not as booty. But most of those have not survived. This is a flag uh, from uh, Marsili Stato, Ottomano uh, Stato Militare dell'Impero Ottomano from the early 1700s. The presentation of war trophies, still a delicate issue today, goes back to tradi traditions of antiquity. In Vienna, not only Ottoman spoils, but also trophies from other 17th century wars, for example against France or the Northern European Protestants, were put on show for propaganda purposes and stowed away in the arsenals. The Ottomans displayed their trophies too. The Austrian ambassador in Istanbul, Ogier de Guzbek, acquired from an Ottoman officer a royal Neapolitan flag captured by the Ottomans in a naval battle and so prevented it in getting into the hands of the Sultan to pre be presented there as a permanent symbol of the Spanish Neapolitan defeat. Ottoman ships returning from battle uh, against Spain, Spanish or Italian ships often drag the captured flags behind, ship in the water, behind the ships in the water 
when they entered uh, Istanbul's port in triumph. Vienna's three surviving red Ottoman silk banners show complex weaving techniques. It's um, lampers uh, with a double thread in the warp to provide stability. And that indicates that they were made in specialized silk production centers, likely in the linked to the imperial arsenal in Istanbul, uh, from where a major part of the Sultan's standing army was equipped and where the imperial tents were made, for example. Uh, Walter Denny also favored Istanbul as a place of production, but Ursa remains an option as well. The Ottoman Sultan was considered at the same time worldly ruler and religious leader. The Habsburg Emperor was anointed and ruled by God's grace. Worldly and religious ambitions met in the sovereigns as well as in the content of the flags and the way they were received and propagandistically exploited in the wider Viennese context. Ottoman silk flags were not only carried in battle. The official Ottoman diplomatic legations of 16th and 17th centuries entered Vienna with great pomp and with banners. In addition to that, uh, flags also played an important role during the pilgrimage transporting the Kisva textiles to Mecca. In fact, textiles linked to the Kiswa context. I, I hear myself, is, is, do you hear me well? Okay. Also show uh, woven inscriptions, but the techniques still have to be compared. Silk flag flags were thus suitable to accompany pilgrimages, diplomatic missions, and military campaigns alike. The elaborate inscriptions on the large banners praise God and the Prophet Muhammad, frequently with the Victory Surah 48 or with exclamations uh, such as God is great or the Shahada or the names of the first, first four caliphs. Juxtaposed, we find motifs such as the crescent moon, stars, or the double-edged sword of Ali Sulfikar. Fittingly, they include allusions to a legitimized holy war against the infidel and place the army under divine protection. They imply that the war against the heretic opponent was God's will. Religious motives were also led into the field by the Christian side, and both sides justified their actions against the infidel as they interpreted each other with a strong religious sense of mission. The first flag to be dealt with today survives but in a print from 1683. It was captured near Vienna by the Polish king, Jan Sobieski, who was commander in chief at the relief of Vienna. He left the battle with the richest trophies in hand. Part of the treasures taken consisted in diverse flags adorning the tent co complex of the Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa Pasha. On the same day, uh, Sobieski sent one, the one flag he thought to be the most important to the Pope in Rome. The next day, he entered liberated Vienna, a captured golden banner and two horsetail insignia of the Grand Vizier were carried before him. When the Emperor Leopold I entered his capital, Vienna, a few days later, he hasn't been present during battle, it is quite certain that he had no high-ranking trophy flags with him. Sobieski sent him but one horsetail insignia. Within a few days, Sobieski upset the emperor threefold, and three times flags were involved. First, he didn't hand over the insignia of the vanquished, but kept almost the whole booty. Second, he, and not the emperor, sent the Ottoman main flag to the pope. And third, the victorious Sobieski entered the imperial capital with a captured flag before the emperor arrived. He thought he could act that independently since, he was, since as king of Poland he was not a subject of the emperor. The emperor was not pleased. They had a very frosty meeting and the emperor would never receive a booty flag captured by Sobieski. He distributed those among his uh, uh, colleague generals. Sobieski thought he sent the original prophet's flag to the Pope. 
Traditionally believed to be a door curtain belonging to Aisha, the black fabric was ca carried by Muhammad's followers into battle as a banner. It was possessed by the different ruling dynasties and fell into the hands of the Ottomans in 1517. At this point, it is already talked of as a green banner. Today, one version at least is kept in Topkapi Palace in Istanbul. Uh, this banner accompanied, well, that's an uh, image of, uh, imagined image of this real banner. Uh, this banner apparently accompanied the sultans at war. In 1596, for instance, Sultan Mehmed III uh, was, uh, went to the field uh, with 300 descendants of Muhammad, Sayyids, and he went into battle again, against the Habsburg. The flag was hoisted before the Sultan, while the Victory Surah 48 was recited by the Sayyids without cease during the battle. And this Surah also featured on many flags. In later times, the Sultans didn't accompany the army into battle. During ceremony, the sacred banner and other objects were entrusted to the Grand Vizier, but it, it never fell into enemy hands. Towards the end of the 17th century, the purportedly sacred flag was replaced by three green banners which each had a piece of fabric from the old flag attached to them. According to Christian tradition, and that's the Christian tradition here in the image, it was the flag that Archangel Gabriel had dropped from heaven into the prophet's hands. However, it was not even this flag that Sobieski had sent to the Pope since he, it had been rescued. The flags Sobieski had captured were merely the Grand Vizier's main flags entrusted to him by the Sultan, together with the horsetail insignia when he left for Vienna. Anyway, he, Sobieski and his contemporaries thought that they had sent the sacred flag, and that was on its way to the Pope. Sending trophy flags to the Pope, a Pope had a long tradition. The first one was, was reportedly sent in 17, uh, 732 by Charles Mattel after the Battle of Poitiers and many others arrived uh, from Lepanto and later. The supposedly sacred banner captured by Sobieski was taken in triumphal procession along with an Ottoman tent to Rome. Along the way, it was paraded before the marveling crowds, for example, in Ferrara, where it was admired for its richness. According to a report, none of the bystanders could hold back their tears of jubilation as they were reminded of the resoluteness of the Turks and the succor of the Almighty. In Bologna, a poem were, and a printed text with the, tri, with the triomphe were dedicated to the flag. Oh, sorry. Okay. A leaflet appeared shortly afterwards, showing the flag and describing it in detail as red with rich golden and silver ornamentation, providing measurements and translating the Arabic text. The translator read the Surah of Victory, the Shahada, and names of the first four Imams. Leaflets like this were distributed, symbolically putting a trophy into the hands of everyone to take home. The importance of the issue was stressed by its translator. The translation of the Arabic text was done by none less than Ludovico Maracci, confessor of Pope Innocent XI, professor at the Sapienza and one of the best known Orientalist scholars of his time. He also translated the Quran into Latin. Finally, in Rome, the, po the banner was given to Pope Innocent XI, who flung it onto the ground and trampled upon it. Subsequently, it was hung up in St. Peter's as a manifestation of victory. It remained hanging there until the 19th century. And we know of other flags that joined this flag, and they hang in, many of them hung in Santa Maria Maggiore. Sorry for this image, it's, it's kept like that. It, it was sewn to the wall and covered with glass and uh, it can't take, be taken out or photographed. As mentioned before, the imperial troops under Charles of, Lor Lor Charles of Lorraine came out of the relief of Vienna almost empty-handed. Finally, one year after the relief in 1684, they captured one of the coveted red silk banners, which Sultan Mohammed IV had bequeathed to the commander-in-chief of the army, Suleiman Pasha then. It was brought to Vienna and displayed to the people of, in St. Stephen's Cathedral. 
In the presence of the emperor, it was placed above the main altar and mass was celebrated. In Pisa, some more than a bit more than a, uh, half a century before, not only the flag was, flags were draped around the altar, but also Ot Ottoman uh, slaves were uh, celebrated with them. The flag remained in the cathedral. It was presented to the faithful every year on the anniversary of the relief of Vienna, like a relic. It, uh, the repeated presentation of the banner prolonged the triumph and impressed it into the collective memory of the people. This banner was still considered so important that at the time it was also translated and published by Maracci. You see that next to the flag. Um, it also appeared in a work of history in 1694 by Constantine Feige with a translation of the inscription. The accompanying text assures the readers that the true Ottoman main flag was captured. Again, the inscription quotes the Shahada, shows a double-bladed sword and uh, with the victory surah. The banner finally landed in the civilian armory and then in the Wien Museum, where it's still on show, behind glass in a corridor. But uh, this image shows the dimensions. That's the curator. So it's, it's, he, he would reach up to here, more or less. So it's, these flags were huge. The flag is heavily restored. Likely that happened still within the Ottoman army. The decorated parts, these parts, uh, no, these parts and this one, were, are all cut and reapplied on, into a new fabric, it's like an inlay. This recycling illustrates the high esteem of these flags within the Ottoman army. The third red silk flag is kept today in the Museum of Military History where it arrived in 1867. The red banner hangs from the ceiling together with many other trophies. The flag was originally installed in a cabinet of the Imperial Treasury where the most important insignia of the Habsburg dynasty were preserved. So it's the most important room of the dynasty, uh, space of the dynasty. Everyone who visited had to go past the flags, immortal wit witnesses to the triumph against the Ottomans. In the report, the flag is described as being from the grave of Mohammed and is said to have been captured from the Ottoman camp at the relief of Vienna. We remember that the emperor received hardly any trophies from the relief of Vienna. Most booty was made in the 14 years, 40 years after it. Quite a shame, in fact, that was covered by, up by reattributing a good part of the booty, booty made later in imperial possession to the relief of Vienna. You see, the emperor made sure that um, he was remained as uh, getting the booty. You see him here in the tent of, of the Grand, Grand Vizier, that, but it never took place like that, of course. Okay. In addition, imperial propaganda corrected history and saw the emperor instead of Sobieski in Kara Mustafa's tent. History was adapted to comply with the Habsburgian Memoria cult. This flag was first published in 1883 uh, when it featured in the commemorative exhibition of the siege in Vienna. Its text was translated by the famous orientalist Josef von Karabacek back then. And he already discovered that it was not from the siege, but a later capture. Um, the fourth flag was recently rediscovered in the formerly imperial Rüstkammer armory. Where, it was mo where the most splendid pieces of arms and armor were displayed, and they were selected by the emperors to be there. And this again stresses the importance of the, the, the flag. And there it was presented among the spl splendid, uh, other splendid pieces of armor. Its place of capture is unknown, but it almost certainly occurred um, after 1683 and likely before 1718. 
It is badly worn, as most flags, since they were exposed to all weathers and other underwent uh, modern restorations. In conclusion, uh, we have seen how Ottoman silk flags were received in different contexts. The first and most famous flag sent to the Pope survives but as a print. The second flag, presented in Vienna's cathedral, survives in the Wien Museum and was also published at the time of capture. The third and fourth flags, captured later, unknown, it's unknown where, were not printed anymore, since they were not considered special enough, likely. And they um, were served as mem memoria pieces in the imperial collections. The first two flags were exhibited in public, like relics, in the center of Christendom, Christendom in St. Peter in Rome, and in the center of European imperial power in Vienna. They were continuously instrumentalized for propaganda purposes, thus fostering the avowal of the people against the common enemy. The, let the latter two served in more private contexts and were accessible but to a limited number of selected visitors. One in the imperial treasury, the main source of legitimation for the dynasty, and the other in the Rüstkammer, the armory, um, a place that was not as important symbolically as the treasury, but it housed the best and valuable, most valuable armors and armors of Europe. Among them, several Ottoman objects that were likely diplomatic gifts. It is fascinating to see how the meaning of the flags, these powerful communicators of Ottoman power, is transformed in the different historic contexts. As the prints demonstrated, there was a widely resonant response to the trophy flags in the visual arts, in South, especially in South and Central Europe. We can find them fluttering in paintings, chiseled into the tombs of generals of, a new, of the generals of a newly rising elite, cast in medallions or visualized in other forms. During the time period in question, they turned into indispensable attributes of victory, not only in Vienna, but also in the regions that were in direct contact and confrontation with the Ottoman armies in the Mediterranean and in Central South uh, Europe. Thank you for your attention.